There are many educational videos about many different topics made to inform a general public about a topic. Typically the information will be somewhat watered down as we don't really need to know the exact specifics. In this video I'm going to take a look at common and non-musician views of the horn as well as some educational videos and instead of making the information quote good for a public point of view, I'm going to tell you straight up what the facts are and correct some wrong information. Also, I'm avoiding the mess of Wikipedia pages about the horn. Starting out, How It Is Made did a segment on horns. Let's see what they said about it. The horn has a four octave range. A four octave range? Keep that in mind for later as other videos are going to touch on the range of the horn. The mouthpiece is relatively small, making this instrument one of the most challenging to play. The mouthpiece is small and that is the reason it's hard to play? If you don't see the issue, what about this thought? Driving a semi is so much easier than driving a golf cart because the golf cart is so much smaller. The opposite is actually more true for beginners. Tubas tend to be more difficult for some to start on because it's too big. There are some students that are started on euphonium or trombone and are moved to tuba later. The horn is a difficult instrument for a different reason entirely, more on that later. Also, the trumpet mouthpiece is smaller than the horns. So would that mean trumpet is more difficult? Ashton Gleckman released a short video on the horn. Let's see if there's anything odd there. In the 16th century, the introduction of the Alp horn brought momentum to the development of the horn. The Alp horn brought momentum to the horn in orchestra? There's evidence of the instrument's existence to at least the 1500s, but they were used as a call for communication to animals as well as other shepherds. It actually fell out of use going into the 1800s before it was revitalized as a musical instrument. The horn was brought into the orchestra by composers for hunting scenes and operas, but Jean-Baptiste Lully used the horns for more than just calls. This style of playing was used by Vivaldi in his double concerti and Bach's Brandenburg concerto. Widely different than a traditional Alphorn call like what you hear in Brahms First Symphony. Fast forward to the 18th century, horns were fairly limited in their availability to playing different keys. The harmonic series was limited to B flat alto, A, A flat, G, F, E, E flat, D, C, and B flat basso. I'm not sure where this information is coming from. While it is correct, it misses some keys. At the very least, C alto is used in Haydn Symphony 48 and B natural in Haydn 46. It wouldn't surprise me if the other missing keys were used during this era as well. In the early 19th century, the first valved horn was built. All the way through the 19th century, the valves matured, including the 1939 introduction of the piston valves. The early 1800s valve mentioned here was a piston valve and was first tested on a horn. That 1939 date doesn't make any sense. Even if he was thinking of the Francois Perronet valve that we see on modern trumpets, that was invented in 1838. Even if we were talking about putting piston valves on horns, the double piston valve on a Vienna horn dates back to the 1830s. Furthermore, the Perronet valve can easily be traced on a horn to before 1939, like in this John Erickson article. But there was a slight issue. Some people had a difficult time adapting to these valve-controlled horns. The French system used piston valves, and the German system used rotary valves. This talk about French and German style horns makes it sound like it happened in the early 1900s. So if the French put the piston valves on the horns in 1939, what were these chromatic horns that Saint-Saëns and Ducat wrote for in the 1800s? The range is generally from F sharp below bass clef to two octaves above middle C. Range is quote, generally? <laughs> Alright, I'll give him that. He lucked out with that word. It's a smaller range than what How It Is Made talked about. Again, more on that later. Because the double horn combines the ranges of the F horn and the B flat horn, it's very commonly used. Wait, the double horn combines the ranges? This is technically correct, it's just misleading. More accurately would be to combine the harmonic series of a single F and B flat horns. But I will admit that is a personal preference on wording since combine sounds like you can play more notes, which isn't true. Triple horns are less common, but include not two horns, but three. This means an F horn, B flat horn, and a descant horn, which is of much higher range than either the F or the B flat horns. 
Triples have F, B flat, and F alto, or E flat alto for some, and from the double horn includes the harmonic series that is an octave higher than the standard F horn. Having this instrument does not magically give you extra high notes that you can easily play. The inclusion of the F alto horn is meant for a timbre difference. I should also note that a descant horn is usually a double horn, using a B flat and F alto. If a player wanted to play below the range of the horn yet still maintain the overall tone and timbre, a player would use the Wagner tuba. Wagner tuba is meant to play lower than the horn? Then why did Stravinsky write a B above the staff in Rite of Spring? Or Don Davis include a C in the first Matrix movie? Or better yet, why Strauss wrote this screamer? Whew, yikes! Okay, it's actually an F basso part, but I thought I'd throw you for a loop. The single F tuba has the same harmonic series as the single F horn, and as you might imagine, the B flat tuba has the same series as the B flat horn. If the harmonic series are the same, then how does the Wagner tuba play lower? If you wanted to write above the general range, the descant horn would be used. Harry Gregson Williams' main theme to Prometheus is a perfect example of the descant horn and how you could enter the range of the trumpet without abandoning the beautiful color that is the horn. So the horn can't go into the higher register without a descant? I'll play that Prometheus solo on F, B flat, and F alto horn. Again, having the F alto horn doesn't grant you extra high notes. It's a slight timbre change and makes the harmonics further apart for upper pitches. Music Learning Activities has a video about the horn and there's some not so great ideas presented. But you'll notice, unlike the trombone and the euphonium, the mouthpiece here is really, really, really small. Um, which, <laughs> which is good because it, it, it's a smaller instrument so it needs to have a smaller mouthpiece. The horn is not smaller than a euphonium or trombone. Those are 9 feet in length compared to the horn's 12. The horn is really easy to put together. Um, there's really not a lot of question about how to do it. You lift it up by the bell. You do not lift the horn by the bell! Oh, that is by far the weakest part of the metal and can easily bend. I have personally witnessed horn bells bending in half from being picked up like this. Do not do this ever! And you put the mouthpiece in at the top and you twist. Her words are correct, but her actions are very wrong. You gently place the mouthpiece into the receiver and then give a small, gentle twist, using only your thumb and pointer finger. By using your whole hand like this, and as hard as she is doing it, you will eventually stretch the metal so the mouthpiece will easily fall out. But in the short term, the mouthpiece can easily get stuck. With a gentle twist, the mouthpiece stays in place. And then a gentle twist in the opposite direction, the mouthpiece easily comes off. The horn is not really an instrument that you should start out with. You can most certainly start out on horn, there's nothing wrong with that. The approach for beginner horns is different though, since ear training has to be highlighted a little bit more for horns so they can hear what partial they're on. More difficult for some, sure, but not overall. As for your right hand, it just kind of sits in the bell, so you would just kind of rest it in there, and that's really all your hands do with it. For beginners, yeah, this could work, but after they are comfortable with the instrument, proper hand position needs to be taught. Trent Hamilton's videos are quite accurate, but there are a few oddities. That harmonic series always follows the same principle. And that principle is that each harmonic is double the frequency of the uh, interval before it. So if you had an interval, uh, if your fundamental was 100 hertz, your first harmonic would be 200 hertz, then 300 hertz, then 400 hertz, and it would go on like that. Going up the harmonic series, he is correct in how this works. The fundamental is one wavelength for the tubing, the next harmonic is two, then three, then four. If you're doubling the frequency each time, one, two, four, eight, etc., then you're going to go up by octave. For Hertz, going up by 100 is wrong, except for the length of tubing where the fundamental is 100 Hertz. We can get the lower harmonics, um, but the instrument's not designed to play them. In fact, you'll find it quite difficult to play them unless you sort of flop your bottom lip under the mouthpiece. You don't need to flop your bottom lip under the mouthpiece. It just takes practice. I'm someone who struggles playing low, but I've played the fundamental many times.
Also note that composers write down there quite often, Strauss, Mahler, and even contemporary composers like John Williams. We've got the logistical difficulties. It's odd holding an instrument with this hand and have this hand do nothing other than have it sort of pitched as a Captain Hook sort of claw. Captain Hook claw? Well, that's the first for me hearing that. It's wrong. Most teachers that I've heard use one of two methods to explain how to position your right hand. Either go for the handshake, then put your thumb down in line with your other fingers, or pretend like you're scooping up water with your hand. Greg Bassett did a long four-hour master class, split up over three weeks, with the Hope Academy of Senior Professionals. And while Greg is a professional horn player, this presentation did have a weird hole in it. You can, you can hear that that is a very different sort of melody than you would get um, in Beethoven. If Beethoven were alive 30 years later, and we're to listen to that, he would wonder how a horn could possibly get all of those notes. This thought about Beethoven not understanding how the horn could play so many notes raises some questions. First, there's a controversy about whether or not Beethoven wrote the fourth horn solo of his ninth symphony for natural or valved horn. Even still though, the nocturne uses notes that you see in Beethoven's horn sonata, so he was well aware of the horn being able to play these. The last video I'll look at is from Health Apta, a channel about health and wellness. Why are they talking about the horn? Weird, but I guess that explains why certain facts are wrong. You know, this is just like listening to me for um, fitness advice. I'm a musician, not a personal trainer. Also, this list of quote facts they include is also found on softschools.com. So the horn has a wider range because of its fourth valve. Oh, wait, he has a fourth valve on his tuba, that's why he can play so high. I get it. <laughs> in all seriousness though, if it's the fourth valve, then why aren't these instruments included in the widest range club? What's the real answer? Four octaves, from pedal E in Mahler 3 and 6, above the staff, which is in Schumann's Konzertstück, or Strauss's Domestic Symphony. And that's the full standard range. Although most composers top out at C above the staff and don't often venture below C below middle C. There have been notes written outside that range, of course, from horn ensembles going down to the pedal C in the London horn sounds Tico Tico. to a screeching B-flat in three-way turn. In orchestra rep, there's an F in Haydn 51. A G in the Arium Box Cantata, BWV 14. But in standard excerpts, a C-sharp is in Haydn 31's excerpt. Personally, I'd consider any professional musician on any instrument good. Wait, the horn doesn't play in the brass band, so it must be a woodwind? The horn is technically a brass instrument, but it is included in the woodwind quintet as well. Eight combinations, but we only use seven? On a single horn, there are only seven options. A double horn, guess what, doubles that. Unless they're referring to the third valve and one and two as separate combinations and we don't use one of them. Typically, we don't use third valve on its own, but on occasion it'll happen, usually for tuning purposes. Anyone notice it in my super horns video? While I think media like these containing interesting trivia about a topic can be fantastic, we do need to remember who the person is and what the source of their information is. Is it a health and wellness channel? If so, should we really trust information about a musical instrument that they provide? In the same way, should you openly trust me, an orchestra musician, about car repair? No. And with that, I pass these questions off to you. 
What do you think about these types of informational videos? Are there others that I missed that may be misleading? Let me know, I'd love to take a look into them, and I will see you all in the next video.